As we talk about artificial intelligence, machine learning, and terms like cognitive computing, do we know what they really mean? And do we understand the impact on the enterprise? That's our topic today on CXO Talk. Fred Lalio is the CEO and the founder of Era Technology. Era Technology is a, is a cognitive platform that enables what we call the, the self-driving enterprise. Uh, it's a platform for what we call cognitive automation, technology that understands how your business works, answers a lot of the questions that you have. Uh, it makes real-time recommendations on how to improve the operations. It predicts business outcomes, and it can take action autonomously. So we built this, this platform over the last few years, and, and we're rolling it out right now. I think, Fred, we need to un try to unpack these terms, terms like cognitive computing, terms like cognitive automation. A and how, how do we begin understanding what this is? It sits really on, the phone, on a vision, which is we're, we're shifting from uh, the era of people doing the work, the work being planning, optimizing, running operations, business operations in finance, in supply chain, in sales, in all the different functions of a company. And they're running this operation. They're doing their job supported by data, by tools, by collaboration platforms. Um, and, and we're getting to a point where now we're shifting from people doing the work supported by software to software, computers doing the work controlled by people, right? That's what we mean by cognitive automation. It's the automation and the augmentation of how decisions are being made and executed in an enterprise, right? So we're using intelligence to actually automate and augment the decision-making process. Fred, is it a matter of first you you aggregate data, or let me let me play devil's advocate or be a little bit facetious? How is this different from analytics and reporting? There are multiple levels of differences. The first thing is that those systems are real time and always on. When you think about analytics and reporting, you'll pull a report, and you, as an analyst or as a manager, you'll analyze the data and start thinking about what decisions, what actions you need to take based on what you're analyzing. That's the whole point about getting access to those reports. Here, the, the, the processing of collecting the data, aggregating the data, making sense of the data, and, and executing a set of logical steps, projections, predictions, optimizations, uh, um, are actually done dynamically by the computer. Right, So it's really think about it as a giant brain that sits on top of your transactional systems and does the work that analysts would actually do, that managers would actually do. It goes all the way to making the decision and taking the action back into the transactional system. So one is a static report that you look at to make the decision. The other one is a dynamic uh, decision-making uh, system that will analyze and take the action. When you talk about being self-driving, what what does that what does that mean? Let me explain to you how it works, right? So the the the, the system end to end, the platform starts by crawling the transactional systems. Uh, we take the the Google analogy, right? When you're when you're crawling the internet to create a, a hot replica of every single web page into a single instance of the cloud, so that you can then index, rank, and make that data. Uh, accessible by a search algorithm, right? That's the way Google works. That's their breakthrough, uh, very smart idea. What we did is we applied the same kind of uh, concept to enterprise data, internal and external. So we deploy our crawlers and we create a replica of the transactional data into a single instance of the cloud. Now we do this across multiple types of ERPs and planning and other types of transactional tools. Um, once the data sits in our cloud, we, we harmonize it, we augment it, we derive from all these billions of rows of transactions the business metrics that you need to actually understand your business. So think about a giant data layer, we call it a cognitive data layer that sits on top of all your transactional systems and brings you the ability to find in a single instance of the cloud all the information that you need to make a decision, right? To think through a decision-making process. Now, once the data is in, in that foundation, that, that cognitive data layer, then you can apply, as you said, uh, data modeling, artificial intelligence, statistical forecasting, optimization, a series of tools that allow you to actually run dynamically 
a, um, a, a process, right? And that process says, hey, I find open orders without matching inventory. What do I do? I need to go and look for excess inventory somewhere else. Oh, I can't find it. Now I need to look for production capa capacity somewhere. And if I do, do I have the material? You see how you can unfold that decision-making process. And the reason why it works in real time is because 100% of the information that you need to make that decision sits in a normalized instance of the cloud. So the crawlers work autonomously. They're constantly updating the cognitive data layer and uh, intelligence on top runs 24 seven. So that's why we talk about self-driving is that the system will either autonomously based on some criteria, take an action back into the ERPs. Let's say I'm going to upgrade my forecast for this product by 0.2% for this outside, uh, outlet for this period. Or if the decision requires a human you know, supervision, it will generate a, a message, a, a, what we call a recommendation that will sit in your inbox. And that inbox will say, hey, Michael, I recommend that you increase your forecast by 3% because I've done all this analysis, I've done all this work, and I'd like to get your supervision. At which point you can say, hey, ERA, yeah, let's, let's actually take that action, thank you. Or you say, no, I don't want to follow ERA's recommendation because you missed something, in which case ERA will ask you, what did I miss? And as a result, the system learns right from your, from your uh, experience and your expertise and gets better over time. So the concept of self-driving is really to have a system that autonomously does the work from collecting, aggregating, augmenting the data all the way to processing the multiple steps that are required to make a decision. And the fully self-driving is in the ability of the system to take action right back into the transactional systems. Could we say that this is similar in a sense to Amazon giving you product recommendations, only this is happening uh, proactively and it's giving you recommendations about the next decision that you need to take or the next action that needs to be performed in a process? And somehow you're absolutely right. I actually will give you, so, so where, where is cognitive automation in action today, right? What are the use cases that, that, that we can apply and deploy it for? Uh, um, uh, forecasting, demand forecasting, collecting all the data and helping to predict uh, what is the, uh, the forecast level for, for a product. That's one. Uh, you have inventory optimization, you'll do promotion planning, all those different complex use cases um, are, are there. And one of them, you talk about Amazon, is around um, you know, order management, helping a large complex organization to predict what is the available to promise date for our complex order. I think you had uh, one of our, our clients uh, uh, a few weeks ago on the show who deployed the technology pretty much for, for that purpose initially. And what we do is we're able to give their customers, their clients, a very accurate uh, delivery date for their very complex order. Now, the challenge here is the data that is required to actually process this, uh, uh, th th this uh, compute sits in 47 different ERPs. So first you have to collect the data, harmonize it, index it, augment it. Then you deploy the algorithms. And now we're able to tell the clients in real time, your order will be delivered that day. Sounds like an easy thing to do because you take the Amazon example where we use that every day. But when you put that at a scale of a very large enterprise with a lot of data complexity and multiple algorithms that have to be deployed, it's a very hard problem to crack. It sounds like the key then is after you're aggregating all of the, collecting all of that data, and I don't want to minimize the, the difficulty and the challenge of, of doing that, but from the business person's point of view, we've got the data, and now the system is making recommendations. Those recommendations have to be A, accurate, and B, things that I would not have thought of myself, because if I can just do it in an easy way, I don't need that system. There are really two angles, right? There, there, there are two things that we're automating, right? The first thing is the, the expertise. And the expertise is you know how to think through a given problem. Um, and that can be modeled, right? Using our, our modeling environment, using data science. The other thing that we need to capture is your experience, right? The algorithms are not going to get everything in the first place. So the question that we had to crack is, how do I build that interface between the, the, the era brain, so to speak, and the users? And the way we've done on this is by saying, hey, you know what? We're going to try false positives sometimes. We're going to send you a recommendation to 
deploy a, a 52 week calendar um, a promotion plan um, and you'll say, you know what, for the third week of July, this promotion makes no sense because people are on vacation. Oh, so it makes no sense to promote this product in that region. Well, maybe the algorithm missed that in the first place, but we're giving you the opportunity to make some correction and bring the information back to the algorithm that will then run again and over time get better and smarter. So we have to digitize basically the, 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 the expertise that you have to think through a problem, but also the experience. And that results in two things, Michael. It results in a, a, a level of automation. I can actually do 24 seven, a lot of the work that you do not have the time to do, but also augmentation because over time, uh, the recommendations that are delivered by the system are more accurate than what humans are able to do, right, to deliver. So there's really a concept of automation and a concept of, of augmentation. And it's interesting to see how the system evolves over time. You know, you, you get immediately the effect of having clean data, single source, having deployed the most advanced, you know, uh, algorithms and, and data modeling capabilities. But you see how the accuracy of the recommendation increases over time uh, because, you know, we don't have any issue with uh, people leaving their job and taking their knowledge with us. Here, we build a, a permanent memory of all the decisions that are made in an enterprise on a given topic by all the different um, uh, actors uh, you know, that are participating to that process. So you would start aggregating those data points, you can make sense of it and you can improve the quality. I'll, I'll take a quick analogy, if you allow me, on, on the self-driving car. Self-driving cars have been um, programmed to drive a certain way on the road, but as you know, they, they, I, think, I think Waymo is more than 20 million miles, maybe around that, uh, of, of, of driving a fleet of car on the rolls to get those experience points, right? Um, we're doing the same thing with that, not self-driving car, but with the self-driving enterprise. We're over time deliver more accurate forecasts, more accurate recommendations on supply demand balancing, more accurate recommendations for promotion planning, ATP, and so on and so forth. So this is a live system that keeps learning from uh, uh, the way the users are, are telling us. You've got the data that you've collected, and how do you interpret that data to come out with a model, so to speak, of the experience of the people? So you've got data points, but you've, you've got to create a, almost a three-dimensional abstraction of the people and their minds. It's actually a little more simple than that, Michael. Um, if I come to you... so. We keep going back to you get the data. So let me just pause one second here because that's really the biggest problem that we had to fix. Uh, if you want to digitize any kind of decision making process, uh, you need to have 100%, not 99%, 100% of the information slash data that you need available in a harmonized with a index understandable by the machines data model. So first problem is how do I go from having 30, 40, 50 different ERPs? And sometimes just one instance of, of an ERP doesn't change. We have to bring all these billions of transactions into the cloud and process it into that uh, uh, cognitive data layer. Once the data is understood in that model, then I need to deploy the logical steps. And ERA keeps track of where it is in a logical step. So if I go to you and I say, I recommend that you shift inventory from this place to that place so that you change the way uh, your, your um, uh, shipments are organized uh, from this data center, uh, this, uh, sorry, distribution center to, a, or to another DC. Um, I will, I know exactly the context in which I'm asking you as ERA that, that decision. I understand your business, your risk, your service levels. I understand the impact of the recommendation that I'm making. And I understand when you grab the decision, if you decide yes, if you decide no, if you override some of the number, all of that is being captured. So effectively, I'm creating a second level of data, which is this uh, decision data, right? I understand what Michael decided to do at this point in time. And then of course, it's another data set that I can superpose to my financial and operational data set and therefore start deriving some very interesting insight and learning how to either retrain 
you as a user and say, hey, you know what? You don't make an optimal decision here or retrain the algorithm saying, you know what? Michael is always right when he says no to that decision. Maybe I need to change the way uh, uh, the decision is, is made digitally in the system. So as with other applications of machine learning, it sounds like the gathering of the data is the crucial piece and the algorithms are easier in comparison. I could not agree with you more. Uh, this is really the fundamental uh, uh, problem. It's not, it's collecting the data. So back to my point of being able to pull the data from an ERP or data lake or whatever, whatever source it is. A lot of companies have built data lake, data grids, data oceans. I'm hearing all sorts of uh, uh, words these days, but we can go straight into the ERP, um, whatever they are. And, and the first thing that we had to crack, really you have to crack is how do I pull that data without materially impacting the performance of the ERP? Because of course your clients will not be very happy uh, if it uh, takes the ERP down for half an hour to pull the data. So we had to crack this there, a lot of work that's happening there. And then, and then there is a second stage of logic, which is how do I take this gibberish, I would say transactional data and transform it into a clean data model. And that's been uh, years of work of, of brute force, of mapping everything. I mean, there's, there's limited intelligence in that process. It's a lot of human work uh, that enables us to build this at scale. Uh, and, and once it's done, it's done forever. And that's the beauty of the model is, uh, you know, with one of our clients, we're running 2,800 crawls a day. We're bringing 1.1 billion rows of data in the system every day, and it runs, runs like a breathe. It just delivers those uh, KPIs, those augmented uh, 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 KPIs that are now feed the algorithm. Now, the algorithm part is not trivial. Um, algorithms are only as good as, uh, you know, the, the way the data has been prepared. So the strength of this system is because the data is so clean and with time series and real time update, we are actually able to, to um, prepare it very, uh, very well so that the algorithms deliver uh, a, good, um, uh, a good prediction in that case or good optimization. The second part is how do you operationalize the, the, the result of, of a prediction, right? Or a, a, or a forecast. How do I in real time take that number that the algorithms has delivered and, and make something with it, right? You don't want it to go into a spreadsheet and to a PowerPoint in front of users in a committee. And you we have found a way to say, hey, data comes in, algorithm runs, decisions made, goes straight in front of you, Michael, or automatically gets executed. And that's the kind of the self-driving concept. It goes really fast. Uh, so the data preparation is one thing, but the execution, the operationalization of the output is, is really critical as well. We have a question from Twitter and Zachary Jeans asks, are you able to use ERA, the technology of ERA in the running of your business? And if so, do you have any examples of that? That's a, we call that project ERA on ERA and it's gonna make one of our uh, uh, guys, super happy that the question was asked. So we're literally doing it right now. To be candid, we've uh, we've been working really hard for the last three years to support some of the largest companies in the world. The technology that we've built um, really is being designed for massive scale to to be deployed with with uh, I think you had J and J and Merck and and Rekit Ben Kisser on your show, and they're, they're all using our technologies. We have a question from Twitter from Sal Rasa who says, what about the cultural shifts that are necessary for an organization to leverage this type of cognitive automation technology? We're at the beginning of the journey. We're only, you know, a year in with uh, some customers being truly live with this system, with the system having somehow either taken over an entire process or really being interacting with, with the users. So, so my perspective is not long enough to draw some, some, some firm conclusions. That's the excitement about what we're doing today is we're, we're experimenting, we're working with our clients in that, in, in that experimentation. But what I can tell you and what surprised me is that um, the aspect of automation uh, came stronger than I expected. In other words, what we've realized, if you think uh, a company that has thousands of planners that are basically operating the business, the supply chain, manufacturing, call this finance, coordinating everything, they're completely overwhelmed. And the idea of giving them more data, more tools, more computation capabilities, more collaboration, faster everything, 
it's reached a point of no return and people are stressed and tired of being asked to do more when they see the competition with digital natives who are actually running a lot faster than them. So they really welcome the technology that we provide because it helps them get through a lot of the work that they can't otherwise get through during a given day, right? So when the system is running 24 seven and doing 80 or 90% of the work and you get to the office in the morning, you can see how this, this, this digital assistant basically has performed work for you, real work and taking actions, it's a real relief. So now you can focus on uh, what you're really good at and what you're uniquely uh, positioned to do. It's designing the, 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 the network, designing some plans as opposed to running their execution. So there's been a real strong um, interest in that automation part as well as the augmentation, because running some of this complex decision uh, is, is very repetitive and very difficult. So, um, but, but the question that you ask, if, if I can uh, talk about one more thing, is super interesting in, in, uh, in one way. We have a client who is running their entire forecast process in what they call touchless forecasting. In other words, the entire processing is done with error. There is no human intervention. So the numbers that are called, the forecast numbers that are called, are 100% called by error. So now, from a cultural perspective, who owns the number, right? Who, who owns error? Who owns the number? The business now is going to execute against a plan that's been designed by a computer. Initial reaction was like, well, that's not my number. But what they delivered, what they really discover is that the accuracy of the forecast, after you run it for a few months, you realize that the accuracy is exceptional. And then suddenly everybody aligns toward it. So yeah, all these changes are happening. Um, and, and, and globally right now, I think the system is pretty much welcomed by the users because it really helps them. So from the point of view of the end user, what does the system look like? So what's the, what's the user interface? There are four things that, that you have to crack if you really want to build a cognitive automation platform. The first thing is the data, and we've talked about it. The second thing is the, the science, right? The, how do I digitize a decision-making process? The third is process, right? How do, I, how do I embed this digital brain inside my organization and work with the users? And the fourth pillar that we work so hard on is change. How do I build a user interface and, and, and an ability for the system to interact with the users in real time in such a uh, hopefully pleasing and, and easy way? So we built a series of tools. One is a called a, I'm gonna use the word cognitive a lot, so I'm sorry about that in advance, but it's called a cognitive workbench. And what it does, it's basically think about it as your email, your Gmail, right? We have different skills, or as different uh, skill set that are working for you in 24-7. Uh, and it delivers those very clean recommendations, just like a message in your inbox saying, Michael, I recommend you change this number. Michael, I recommend you change that promotion. You right-click on it, say, tell me why, or you say, do it, or you say, don't do it. So then we had to really build that new tool that allows you to interact with the, the system. And that interaction actually is real time because the recommendation that ERA will make at any point in time might change. I come to you at two o'clock Tuesday saying, I recommend you change your shipment uh, structure for this product, uh, for this customer. But maybe at four o'clock, the business contact has changed. ERA has captured some external signals and internal signals, and that recommendation either changed or is not made obsolete before you even touched it. Meaning, we have to be able to get to you 24-7 if you want to. So we build this very cool app that um, where ERA can speak to you, right? Literally, it's like Alexa or Siri. You get in your car in the morning and you say, ERA, what's, what are the open actions for me or for my team? And I will tell you, you got 24 open actions that are open recommendations for an impact of $47,000. This is what they are. Do you want to do it? And you can literally use the voice to interact with the system, just like you would do with Siri or Alexa to turn off the lights in your house or put some music. So the same kind of interaction has been built and it's, uh, it's a hit. People really enjoy that. Well, I suppose it's a hit because if it's giving accurate results and from the user perspective, the the way to access those results is pretty, it's pretty simple. There's no way to lie about this, right? So ERA will make a recommendation to do something and it will calculate and it will tell you exactly, this is the financial operational service level risk. This is the impact of that recommendation and this is the time frame. And you'll check over time 
was it right or was it wrong? So the system is, you, you build that trust because there is no, um, there's no um, uh, subjective aspect about it. It's fully objective. Was the recommendation right? Was the recommendation work? Talk about change and adoption. The, the best email I get is every Friday, this customer says, this week we had 147 recommendations for this specific, whatever, department, unit uh, from ERA for a total value of $546,000, uh, out of which 97 were accepted, the rest was rejected, this is why. You can literally measure the impact of that system in real time, every week, every day. And, and again, that's a very different way of thinking about, uh, uh, about how you're running a business, but it's absolutely objective. This concept of trust, please elaborate on that. That seems like a crucial point to me. If I come to you and I say, I recommend you do something that impacts your, the, the way you're performing at work, you'll challenge me and say, hey, hold on, Fred, can you show me where the data is coming from? Can you explain to me how, what the logic, what's the logic that you've applied? Hey, did you check with so-and-so that they were okay with that? Did you measure the impact of that decision on the, you know, the rest of the impacted uh, ecosystem? You're going to challenge me. And then after a while, when I come to you, if I'm always you know, giving you the right answers, or the, uh, then you'll say, Fred, yeah, I got, I got it. I trust you. You can go ahead and run this for me. So the way the system runs initially is you, you can define the threshold, right? So at first, there are a lot of recommendations that the users have to get through and say, hey, I agree with ERA on this. I don't agree with ERA on that. You might run system in parallel until you realize that, you know what? The accuracy of the recommendations delivered by ERA is better than what we've been able to achieve manually, which makes perfect sense because the system works with a lot more data, can manage a lot more complexity. Uh, it's your uh, uh, way of thinking that's been digitized, so you shouldn't be surprised there. And it works 24-7. So um, once that, when you see the numbers, you start trusting the numbers, but every time, every new client, we're going through that process of, whoa, what is that system telling me? And then you build that trust. Without the trust, the 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 automation is very limited. You need, you need trust to actually deliver automation. And with automation, you actually build what I call augmentation. The system gets, you, you interact more with the system, the system gets smarter over time, and it's a virtuous uh, uh, loops if you want. And we, as a company, can now monitor the performance of every skill that we deploy with our clients in real time. We actually have this, um, concept of AAR, ERA Accepted Recommendation and ERA Automated Recommendation. So we monitor this in real time. It's not like a software that you just say, hey, Michael, I've installed it and call this number when you have a problem. We're actually in this continuous engagement with our clients saying, hey, uh, the accuracy went down this week for this specific region and for this specific uh, forecasting process. Let's look into it together. And of course, clients look into it and we're here to support. So you, you look at this as real-time engagement and the trust builds over time. It's actually, if I say one more thing on this, I was surprised because I was expecting trust to take more time and I think I'd, uh, to, to, be, to be picking up. And I think I'd underestimated the amount of pain uh, that is uh, going on right now in large enterprises when they're trying to simply keep up. We're, we're, we got to a point where we're expecting folks in planners and others to actually become as good as computers and, and that, that's not the right thing to do. We've increased the cadence, so to speak, to a point that's not sustainable. We need that, that digital relief. Let's pick up on this topic of augmentation. And we have a question or a comment from Zachary Jeans again. And it's an interesting one. He says, so with, with the Terminator movie fresh in our minds, do ERA customers or prospective clients have concerns about automation and the whole concept of the robots taking over our jobs? Of course, and we're now touching on something a, a little broader, um, but it's, uh, it's unavoidable. Um, a lot of, uh, we have a client who has a very color way of, and I'm not, uh, this is a, a show in the morning, I'm not going to use that word, but 
let's say he calls it uh, bad jobs. And he says, look, there is a lot of bad job, bad, bad, bad stuff that people have to do that can be automated. And the whole idea is to reposition uh, people's attention and work and effort into the, the value added stuff that computers don't do very well. But asking someone to repeat the same kind of uh, processing over and over year after year is not interesting. So there is a level of automation, but look, automation is in our life everywhere. And, and, and what we're seeing right now happening with uh, what I call the center of the pyramid, right? You get, you get the, the, um, your, your factories and the shop floor, and then you have your, your CEO up there. And in the middle, there's a lot of repetitive uh, uh, operations. Um, if you think of what happened in the shop floor, we went from p people doing the work supported by big machines to machines doing the work controlled by people. We're just bringing that concept up and I think it's creating a lot more opportunities for people to work on interesting stuff. Uh, so yes, of course, there is a level of automation, but people, uh, as I said before, the reaction that we see from, from, from the, those operators is like, thank God you're helping me here because I don't have to spend you know, six hours a day pushing data from one tool to an Excel spreadsheet to a this to a that, running after people to get an approval and coming home feeling that I only covered 20% of what I was supposed to cover. This is a helping tool. This is a tool that takes away a lot of that repetitive work, uh, but also delivers augmentation. So it's not just about, you know, doing what you are doing, but it's doing it in a way that's more efficient, where computers can actually, quote, quote, beat the human, and we should welcome that. So it's removing a lot of repetitive labor, essentially. Yeah, absolutely. And also enabling things that would not otherwise be possible. Let me give you a, you were asking the question of, of uh, uh, augmentation. Let me give you a very simple example. If you think about uh, promotion planning, right? So you create promotion plans so that when you go to a store, you get the buy one, get one free, or you see the product in front of the shelves. But that is, that has to be planned month in advance. And that budget that's allocated to promotion plan is the second largest spend for consumer packaged food companies. Now think about the work that really has to be done to adjust to, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the digital natives, the marketplaces that are actually buying products and doing promotions on the fly and shipping that to your home in real time. Uh, you cannot ask the, the account managers who are responsible to build these promotions to constantly monitor every single feed and adjust. And there is a lag time actually with your supply chain. So here you have a system that literally every day can read through billions of point of sale data, merge it with uh, Nielsen Elasticity data, look in real time at the levels of your supply chain, predict what those levers are gonna be and optimize basically that supply demand. It makes no sense to make a promotion if you can't supply. And, and this is very complex. So you want people to actually tell the system, this is the way I want you to think about it, but then please run this 24 seven, right? Our, our brains are not meant to analyze data in, in real time across multiple time horizons, and we're not computers. We need those computers to do the work for us. So we have then another question from Twitter, which I think relates to, to this, which is, can you kind of summarize the relevance of this kind of technology to business people? Or to put it another way, the, uh, a business leader, why should a business leader care about this? Think about the, the disruption that an Amazon has brought to the world of retail, consumer packaged good, and so on and so forth. And every leader that I meet that can be disrupted by their technology and by their organization uh, is reaching out to us and say, the, the foundations, the foundation, fundamental pillars of our organization are being threatened, right, by this world that's moving very, very fast. These digital, digital disruptors think about everything as a piece of technology, as a software. And we're still structured in this big old pyramid on top of 47 different ERPs. And we're trying to ask our people to run faster and faster and make more accurate decisions. And we're trying to bring the decision-making process closer to the point of impact and closer to real time. And they've reached a peak. They know that the relative and the absolute uh, performance of a lot of their functions is degrading rapidly as a result of 
um, you know, uh, rotations in, in, in um, uh, workforce and a lot of different factors. So they know that they're actually, as I said, relative and absolute performance is degrading and, and that if they don't start building that, that digital layer that allows them to catch up really and anticipate and react to the digital disruption that's pushed on them by the digital natives, um, they're going to be in trouble. So um, there is a high level of relevancy. If I candidly tell you what surprised me when we launched ERA was how relevant the topic was with a C-level executive in the largest companies in the world. And I was very proud. It's two and a half years ago, we launched a concept of the self-driving enterprise, the cognitive operating system. And I thought, wow, we're up there. It's going to take... The, the, the execs that we talked to didn't say, wow, congratulations, guys. They said, where have you been? We've been waiting for this for a long time. And you as an industry keep telling us that you're going to make our people better. That's not the point, guys. We don't want that. We want to free our people from doing a lot of the bad work that they shouldn't be doing and focus on engaging with the clients, engaging with the community and doing all this kind of intelligent stuff. So the reaction is there. The, the appetite for, for that kind of uh, technology is clearly there. And the relevancy is higher than I've ever experienced in my career. Fred, as we finish up, what advice do you have for business leaders who are listening to this and saying, yeah, we, we want to do this? How should, how should companies prepare for adopting these kinds of technologies and the, the changes that it, that it may bring? My advice is always the same, is jump in. Um, and and I'll, I'll loop back to something we talked about, Michael, a little bit earlier, which is starting to create that digital memory of how decisions are made and executed in your enterprise is the key to having the algorithms get smarter over time. And, and you have to start building that, that data set, right? So the early adopters that have been doing this for 12, 18 months already see an impact on the quality, on the accuracy of the algorithm. And they can automate, augment more. So there's a really a virtuous circle when you get going. So my advice is like, take one process, take one function, logistics, supply chain, take whatever you want, but get started. Start learning, start operating with that uh, support in mind. Just think about ERA or the cognitive automation as a supporting platform, right? And if you wait, well, that data collection process will, will actually be delayed and it will take much longer. Now, if you have that system running 24 seven, you get more accurate, you run a lot faster, you increase your agility, you become a lot more competitive. I mean, significantly more competitive. You know, you can adjust your pricing level, your supply level and so on and so forth. And your competitors who are still uh, analog, um, you know, are um, not able to do that uh, at the same speed. So my advice is pick one topic, start deploying the technology uh, and, and learn from it, right? And as far as preparation, there's not much because we build in a way that allows us to plug into any landscape. You can have 40, 50 different ERPs that are not talking to each other. We take care of that. For us, the vision is always to be, has been to enable non-digital native companies to actually operate as fast and as efficiently as digital native companies that were born in the last 20 years. And for that, without asking them to rethink their, their what I call their bedrock of ERPs, their, 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 their fundamental transactional landscape. Because if we ask them to touch that, you know, they're not going to make it. It's, it's just too, too, too big of a transformation. So we had to actually enable our technology to plug on their diverse landscape, uh, as opposed to asking them to come to our technology. But long story short, I would say that my advice is start now. I can see an increased interest. We're doing pilots in many of the largest companies in the world. And, uh, and it's really critical to get that, that process started early so that you can build that intelligence uh, uh, relative to how your decisions are being made and executing the company early. Are there things that a company has to do regarding the data collection, do they have to change their operations in any way to start gathering the data? No, no, no. That's, that, that's exactly a critical point, which is our technology will plug on top of their ERP, whatever they are, 
and understand the mapping and do all this stuff. So you don't have to. There is a bit of work and adjustments and it's never as easy as it sounds. But in a matter of weeks, you actually have that cognitive data layer built on top of your uh, ERPs or your, as I said before, your data, ocean, lengths, uh, swamp, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so no, there's not a lot of preparation. Now, the preparation is in the um, validation of the metrics that are calculated by ERA and then really is on the cognitive automation and the cognitive augmentation. When you deploy a skill, you want to make sure that it's adjusted to the way you operate. So there is, there is work that needs to be uh, uh, done there. So ultimately, then it's giving feedback into the system about the, the results that have been achieved so that the system can correct itself for the future. Correct. Yeah. And it's the system that corrects itself, but it's also sometimes the users that can correct themselves when you actually see this is how you make this kind of decisions in that type of context for this business value of a time. You may decide to think the way to change the way you actually think as well. So it's a system adjusting, and sometimes it's the user readjusting to to this new light that we shed on how decisions are made in a company. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. It's been a very fast forty five minutes. Fred, thank you very much for taking your time to be with us today. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks for having me, Michael. Thank you. We've been speaking with Fred Lalio who is the founder and CEO of Era Technology. Before you go, please subscribe on YouTube and hit the subscribe button at the top of our website and we'll send you great information. Thank you so much, everybody, and I hope you have a great day and come back next time and we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.